Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that we're able to be here together today and openly observe this day. Uh, Lord, I don't think that it's important so much if it's on the actual day as much as we remember. It's what you asked on the night that you uh, went to the cross, that you were arrested. You asked us that every time we we do this and we take part in communion, uh, that we would remember you every time we think about this day, every time uh, we think about that meal. And uh, so, Lord, we just want to remember you today and what you've done for us in the beginning of the three days and all that it means to us, the importance of this whole thing, Lord. May it never become a religious thing, a religious meeting, a religious ceremony, or even just pages in a book. But, Lord, may this always be something that grips our heart and uh, brings us, Lord, to our knees and, and calls us back to repentance and helps us to get focused again, Lord, back on you and what you've done. And, Lord, I pray that it causes us to... <coughs> to run out into the world and, and proclaim your gospel and reach out to others so that they know the love that we know. So, Lord, just be with us tonight. Open up your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Sure, turn around and greet each other. Now, I think, you know, I know I was a little bit late, but we're even later because you guys wouldn't stop that already, so. Anyways, so the last couple of years, I think I did kind of the same thing, and I looked at the trials of Jesus, I think is what I focused on, and the illegal aspects of, of every single one, six different trials, every one is illegal according to their own culture, including the Romans, you know, we, we get this idea that the Romans just did whatever they wanted to do, but they had very strict laws on how they were con- to conduct themselves, and, and, and uh, some of our traditions that we have in our legal system come from the Roman system, uh, and so... You know, there, there are different aspects of it, all completely illegal. The physical violence in the Jewish trials and the, um, the, f- the false accusations. They couldn't get two witnesses to agree on anything. Uh, happening at night and happening in different places and not enough time for all of the Sanhedrin to come together and not enough hours. I mean, these, these things weren't supposed to take place in the Jewish tradition immediately. There was supposed to be time, accusations made, cases made, and then time given to make the decision. And none of that was observed. None of the things of, of the Roman culture and their legal system was observed. And so I kind of, I focused on that, but I'm not going to do that today. I wanted to look at something a little bit different. And I kind of feel like I'm jumping into the middle of the story because I want to go right straight to the cross in, in the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. And, and I was even thinking about that on the way here. Do, how much do I do? And, and we'll go through the whole story, but as far as reading in that, it's going to be predominantly what was said on the cross. But even as I was coming in, I think I was thinking about the illegal trials, and there's six trials, and I'm going, man, the number of man, right? Uh, <clears throat> created on the sixth day, we've, we've kind of assigned that to man, but seven statements of Jesus on the cross. With the last one being, it is finished. The seventh, the, the number of completion, and, and what is that seventh statement? But it is finished. Or, well, actually, it's in your hands. I come in my spirit. I'm sorry. So six was, was it is finished. But, but all of that. I better look at my notes. Yeah, six was finished. All right. Anyways, all of that. You have seven statements. Then you have the number of completion on the cross. It's completely done. The sacrifice that was made for us. And then in my going over things today and looking at things and listening to some people, and I come across this, I, I foolishly see, I... I find ways to torture myself with these false teachers. I, I just do. It used to be you flip the TV when nobody's looking. I'd land on the TV stations where they're at and just drive myself crazy. And then sometimes I'll listen to them on the radio. And it has to be when nobody else is in the car because nobody else wants to hear me get upset about it. But then I've, I've followed some of these guys now on Facebook. And the one that I've been following is the Jewish Roots page. And they just made me mad today because they are full-on attack today. And, and, and it started off, as far as I can tell, I don't know a, a whole lot about that movement, but it started off with the idea that the church needed to understand its Jewish roots and, and kind of go back to that. And, and, you know, I like that. I get into that a little bit. I, it helps you to understand, even if you understand the way uh, um, a Jewish man might think or process some things, it helps you to understand Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost or when he stands in front of the Sanhedrin. And some of the things that he said. It helps you understand Passover. That's why we do it every year. We, we point to this day and, and how Jesus fulfilled the Passover on Passover. And so it, it, it kind of, as far as I know, it started that way. But I'm seeing now, even within that movement, there are beginning to be two divisions. There are people who are saying, 
in, in like the one I read today that really kind of upset me was it was a, an attack on the New Testament and, and how it is not in alignment with the Torah. And, and so I, I've watched a couple of these guys on YouTube, and you can see the fracture starting even in that movement where these guys are saying, wait, this is not what we signed on for. And, and they're realizing they're being brought under Judaism. And I can understand after today and what I read today why it appears when we see some of Paul's letters why he was so angry about it. You know, when he would say to the Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who brought you back under this? And, and, uh, and, and I think what made me angry was making me at first, when I first started reading the article, maybe second guessing some things about Passover and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and I mean, I go to, we do, go to pretty great lengths to, to show all the ways that Jesus fulfilled the Passover. Well, this guy went in the other direction and how he could not possibly have fulfilled the Passover. Because this doesn't happen and that doesn't happen. I'm like, ah. <laughs> and, and I don't, you know, at first I was maybe a little upset with myself. See, I, and again, I can't hardly get this out of my head today. So I'm, I'm just kind of hopefully process a little bit with you before we get into this. But um, I, I remember coming out of the charismatic movement with this stuff, with the same kind of thing. My, the guys that I followed, the teachers that I followed, and realizing they're not right. And some of what I believe about being filled with the Spirit is not right. And, and yet I could see how along the way God had prepared my heart because I never really participated in the extremes that they were promoting. But at the same time, I still believe in being filled with the Spirit. And I could see both sides of this. But so God protected me and was able to make it so it was an easy split for me to go away from that and move away from that. And I can see, and I, and I, and I, <clears throat> you know, I, God kind of impressed on me as I was dwelling on it again on my way here to pray for those guys that are, are having their eyes open into the trap that they've been pulled into. Not that it's not okay to know the Jewish roots, but that it has to be dietary. It has to be the law, and it has to be not Paul. I mean, they're, they are against Paul, and, and the whole reason I even know anything about this was because I was warned a couple of years ago that in our area, this is a big thing. And, and so anyways, pray for that. Pray for me, because every year I kind of wrestle with Passover too. I don't want to go there. I mean, we've had a Calvary Chapel that was fairly local here that did that, and they got sucked into that and they're not a Calvary Chapel anymore. And, you know, a lot of people had friends that were there, and, and you know, it, it just, it took a long time for some of them to heal from that. So just be careful, I guess is what I'm saying. Not everything that looks great is great. And, and I'm always wondering about how far should we go? How long do we do Passover? Do we do it every year? Every year, I wonder if I should do it again that year as far as a corporate thing. But it's to be a teaching time, and it'll always be a teaching time. And it'll always be about teaching the kids, and it will be about how Jesus fulfilled the Passover. And, and we tend to look at the other feast days, too, and how he fulfilled those. Um, anyways, all of that, just to get it off my chest, I guess, I don't know. So we have this day that we remember. And maybe that's, maybe that's why it came to my attention. I, I don't want this Good Friday to be a religious day any more than I want our Seder meal to be a religious day. Um, and, it, and it was growing up. This time of year was religious for us in the church that we went to. We went to Good Friday service. And we went to the sunrise service on Sunday morning. And then we went home for an hour. And then we went back to church. And we were there for the regular Sunday school and services. And then we were there Sunday night. And, and it, it wasn't... I don't think religious to me in my heart because I just wanted to be there. It was the church, man. It's where I, where I got saved. I wanted to be where Jesus was. You know, I was fairly young, so I still maybe didn't get the idea that you know, I knew he was always with me, but at the same time, I wanted to be in his house. That was ingrained in me. So I don't want it to be religious <clears throat> because this is what God was, was setting us apart from. It was setting us one of the things. It was sin, being the sacrifice for our sin breaking the bondage of, of religion, breaking the bondage of our own desires, our own lust, and in conquering, most of all, conquering death. First Corinthians chapter 15 says that one day that final enemy will be defeated completely. And it, it, that's something for us to remember. I like that this is, honestly, there's no visitors here today because this should be an intimate time. This should be a time when, when those closest to one another, remember what happened. Even if you think about Passover, Passover was family in the house together. Unless you weren't big enough to t consume a whole lamb, and then you grabbed, your neighbors came together. But it was family, and, and it was close, and it was intimate. And, and it wasn't as elaborate as it is now. A lot of what we address on, on the Seder is, is added tradition, but it always still points to Messiah. They still don't understand that that's what's happening. It's obviously not the same as 
the original Passover and done quickly, and I mean, we really don't do it very quickly. <laughs> and there's a, there's a lot of reading that's been added to it. They didn't have the Psalms when they left, and we read, you know, at the time we reread some of the Psalms together, and they didn't know about Elijah yet, and we go and we set a place for Elijah, and we go look for Elijah, and we just kind of go through the motions of all of that and teach about what's going on. So there's a lot of things that have been added. Anyways, seven statements. This is what I landed on for today. And I've got them all written down here. I'm trying something new with the notes thing. So be careful or be patient with me. First one, Father, forgive them. Right? He, has, he has spent time, and that is Luke 23, verse 34. He has come away from spending time with his disciples, had the, the last Passover, the last, the, the last supper that we observe. And really, as a church tradition, we only... Or at least I grew up only observing the one cup. There's four cups during the feast. We only observe the one cup and the breaking of the bread, which would be the breaking of the afikom and, and, and that being returned and, and them eating that. Um, going to John, which I almost went and just said, you know, we'll go through John, and he takes time from the dinner after he's been, you know, Judas has been indwelt by, by Satan, and they're gone. He's gone. Jesus is sending away, go and do what you have to do quickly. They've been in the garden. On the way to the garden, Jesus teaches them. When he's in the garden, he's praying for them. He goes off by himself a distance with Peter and James and John and then leaves them and goes a little farther. And, and, and we hear the, the cry, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. If there's any other way that this can happen, three times he prays that prayer. And uh, I heard another teacher teaching on that aspect of it this week. And, and he points out, you know, that prayer, being on your knees and being in submissive prayer always brings you in line with God's will. You go into prayer with the idea that you're going to submit to the Father no matter what. You will be in line with his will. And Jesus demonstrates that for us. He doesn't flinch after that. He's not really flinching there. I think he's just setting the example there that one of the disciples is close enough to even hear and pass it on. But they come to arrest him. He says, who do you seek? Or they, and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, it's me. I am. I am is what he says. He doesn't say it's me. He says, I am. And they can't even stand up in his presence. They all fall down. 600 people. You know, I know some Pentecostal guys that wish that they could have that. All, boom, just hit the dirt. And then he lets them, that's my opinion, he lets them stand back up. And he says, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I've already told you that I'm he. I've already told you I am. Only this time he lets them stay standing. This time he lets them take them. Peter tries to hack off a guy's head and only gets an ear. And Jesus has to heal that right then. He's being arrested. He's being led to this moment, and he heals the guy. He goes into the first set of trials, and while he's there, two of his disciples are there. Peter's one of them. Peter denies him three times, just like he said he would. That last time, Jesus and Peter are close enough to each other that they make eye contact. And I don't, you know... Sometimes we'll tell our kids, don't do this. If you do this, this is going to happen, right? And we get the I told you so. And we have an I told you so look even with people sometimes. And I don't think that's what Peter got from Jesus. I think he just got that broken, you're going to hurt for this. Peter's heart being ripped and broken at that time. And Jesus standing there watching and knowing what he's feeling. Jesus is abandoned by everybody. <clears throat> he's beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah says even beyond the recognition of being a man and marched through the streets carrying his cross. So exhausted that somebody else then has to carry it for him. Simon has to carry it. It's up there. He's nailed to the cross. He's put up on the, on the cross. They drop it in the ground. He's got two guys on either side of him. Insurrectionists probably. They're being put down by Rome. This is the, the Pax Romana, right? Peace by force. This is what you do if you get out of line with Rome. Both cursing him, both at him. And in all of this, with all this going on around him, Jesus' first words are a prayer to the Father. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they, don't, they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. They're fulfilling words in the psalm. Now, the Romans are. Casting lots for his clothes, dividing his clothes, <clears throat> gambling for the, the one so they don't split it. Mocked by the soldiers, mocked by the crowd. Pilate's attempt to make a dig at the Jewish leaders just adds to the whole thing when he puts on the, the sign this is uh, this is the king of the Jews just adds to the whole thing because everybody that just incites everybody not even just toward Pilate but toward toward Jesus somehow in all of this and maybe it's because that prisoner hears 
Jesus say, Father, forgive them, and they don't know what they're doing. He hears that prayer, and he looks at Jesus. And, and at first, he, he, he yells at the other guy, because the other guy's just, just at him. I mean, can you imagine being at the point of death? You are being put to death. You're being tortured, and you still will turn on the guy next to you and just curse and just be vile. Verse 39 of Luke there says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged, or who were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So the the first is a, is a, a prayer to the Father to forgive all those who are wrong, setting the example for many martyrs that have come in the past, between then and now, Stephen being one of them, as he's being stoned to death, Father, forgive them. And now he's standing there and, and he pardons a sinner. He pardons him. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. There, there's not an inkling of self-preservation here. There's not a there's not a an inkling of you're going to get yours when I get off of this cross, when I come out of the tomb, even when I come back, you're going to get yours. What did John tell us in John chapter 3? Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. Because the world's already condemned. He didn't have to come to condemn them. He doesn't come as a, as a judge, as a cruel leader. He comes with grace and mercy, even on the cross, in all of the pain, in all of the agony. And then in John, the next would be John chapter 19, verse 26. All of this has taken place already. All of this is going on. And the worst is yet to come. And he knows that. Right? But with verse 25 in John chapter 19, he says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cl Clopas, uh, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. I've wondered sometimes, how do you take the youngest guy in the group, likely still a teenager, and commit the responsibility of your mother to him? But even more than that, I mean, before we even get to that detail, you're on the cross. You're being tortured to death. You're suffocating. And there's still a personal responsibility to take care of. Your mother's standing there. It is, as the oldest in the family, your responsibility to make sure she's cared for. And in all of that, I can't imagine in all of that, I mean, think about it. Some of us have, have, we have injured ourselves. We've busted our thumb with a hammer, whatever. The last thing in the world that we're thinking about is taking care of anybody else. We, we want ice. We want a doctor. We want morphine. We want whatever it is it's going to take to get that to quit hurting. We want that immediate pain need met. But in all this, Jesus is completely selfless. There's one more thing that has to happen before the worst begins. I got to take care of my mother. She's here. John is here. And some might imply because, or you might think that he's the only one there. He's the only disciple close enough to even hear the words of Jesus. So that's why. But I don't think that's why. We know from church tradition that John lived longer than anybody else. Some of these guys, John's brother, is going to die probably before Mary. I'm not sure when. We don't know when she died. At least I don't know when she died. But I'm assuming that because James was the first of the 12 to be put to death. And it was likely before Mary died. And here's John caring for Mary. Imagine what she maybe did for John then when his brother is put to death. But he's going to live long. He's going to outlive everybody. He's going to outlive Paul. He's 90-some years old, has to be carried into a place to be able to teach. You know? And John had, even though he had his moments, just like Peter, I mean, you know, you, you, your mother comes and asks if you can sit on the right hand and your brother sit on the left hand or, or whichever way God wants to put it. But, and they're called the sons of thunder. He and his brother want to call down fire from heaven and wipe out a whole village because they rejected Jesus. So he's had his moments, but there's something in John. And, and John even refers to himself in his own gospel here, the one whom Jesus loved. There's something in that relationship that's close. And so he does his duty from the cross in all of that pain musters up the con the concentration enough to take care of his mother's needs to make sure that they're cared for and then it begins we have the cry from the cross that is in mark and in matthew and i'm gonna go to matthew and read it but it, and it's the only one that's in mark it's the only comment from the cross that is in mark but matthew 27 verse 45 this is now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And most believe that this is the time, those three hours, that Jesus took on the wrath of God. This is when he's paying for the sin. This is when the separation has happened. This is when he's taking on the wrath of God. The three hours of darkness, I, I've always, I believe that it was probably the entire earth. We know for certain it was the area. There are even writings my understanding from that they found in, in Egypt of that day when this mysterious darkness for no reason not a solar eclipse but this mysterious darkness it covers the land but why not I mean it is a very dark time right I mean we're, sin is being dealt with is being paid for for everyone John the Baptist points to him as he begins his ministry that's, that's kind of the moment we look at the, when he sees Jesus and then he, he baptizes him later but that moment he looks at him and says behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not just the sin of the believer, but the sin of the world. Paid for everybody. You cannot offer this to everybody if the price has not been paid for everybody. There are those who are going to reject. We know that. And they'll, they'll pay. They'll pay for all of an eternity because they're guilty. We're guilty. Jesus was not guilty, so he could pay the price and come back. Perfect. Innocent. Conquers sin. Overcomes it. Can make the payment and walk away. And I got to thinking today, why, why would I even think that the darkness covered the entire earth? But we see in Matthew again, before this, Jesus talked of a time when he comes back. All the lights are going to go out. The sun, the moon, the stars, complete darkness going to cover the earth because, well, I shouldn't say necessarily complete darkness, maybe for a moment. But because the only thing that will be shining at that moment is the glory of God that envelops Jesus. His glory. When he comes back, everybody in existence on the earth will know that he's here. Everything that they know, the things that they know to be real, the sun, the moon, the stars, all go out. He is the only light. And here, you have three hours, complete darkness. It looks like Satan is one. We read in Colossians that at this point, he makes a spectacle of the evil ones, of the fallen. He publicly defeats them here. When he can come out of that darkness and come out of the wrath, and still, the next thing that he says shows that he's a man. He is 100% God, absolutely. That's why he could was able to live life and, and be perfect. He was not a descendant of Adam. But at the same time, he is still 100% man. He felt all of those beatings that he took. He felt his skin being laid open. He felt all of it. He felt the suffocation on the cross. He felt the dehydration of all of the torture that he's been through. And when he comes out of that time of wrath, the first thing he says is, I thirst. I remember where it's at. I think it's in Luke. Yep, Luke chapter, or I'm sorry, John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the, a sponge uh, with sour wine and put it on, or put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, this is, Number six, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his he gave up his spirit. So he says, I thirst. He can barely talk. When he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, Matthew tells us that they mocked him and said he's calling for Elijah. They don't really understand what he's saying. Somebody did because Matthew wrote it down. Mark recorded it. And he's saying, my God, my God. He's not crying for Elijah. He's crying for God. He, he's speaking the words, I believe, that are in Psalm, right? Psalm 22. But maybe because his mouth is so thick, so dried up he, it's hard to understand him certainly i mean he's been beaten he's been i mean this has been a night of torture you know the the, the persians they believe started the the whole crucifixion thing but they say the romans perfected this and people would live i think this is the longest one was 13 days living on the cross 13 days that's a long time to be up there some people uh, we got kids here i'm not even gonna go there so he cries out i thirst He's a man. He still needs. He has not got his resurrected body yet, that new body where he, he just appears through locked. You're in a crowd. You're in, in locked room. You're hiding from everybody, and he appears in the middle of you. Or he, he goes and he blesses the meal for the two witnesses in, in Emmaus. And, and, and when he goes and he bres, breaks the, the bread and he, and he says the blessing, they realize who he is, and he just disappears from them. He just goes away. And, and they go through all that time between there and... and, and and the ascension, all that time of, of he's here, he's gone, he's here. He's gone. You never knew when he was going to show up. 
He's here? He's gone. Right. He's got it, man. I don't care. He ain't bothering me a bit. If they repeat the stuff, they repeat the stuff. They need to. They need to know. He's here and he's gone. And no wonder that they would teach that Jesus could come back at any moment. They'd be ready at all times for him to come back. This day, we're going to see when we get into Thessalonians, that his return, when he calls out his church, that should not take us by surprise. It'll be like a thief in the night to everybody else, but we're to be sober and awake and about our Father's business so that we are not surprised on the day that it happens. We're to know the times. Right? That was part of the charge we saw on Sunday toward especially for the Pharisees, but all of Israel, that they didn't know the day of their visitation. They should have known that that day was coming, that Messiah would come into the, into the city. He held them responsible for that. The church should be responsible for knowing the time and the seasons. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We certainly know the condition of the earth and the, and the society and the people. We know. We know when it's should be coming. And, and even though we don't know the day, the hour, that should motivate us to always, always be looking, always be ready. How many times have we seen in the epistles, in John's epistles so far, every single one of them, right? Live worthy of the calling. Live worthy of the name of Jesus. Live this way. Follow the example that is set for you. So it is finished. I'm sorry, I thirst was that one. And then again, we, and we read all the way through there in verse 30. It says it is finished. It's done. The price has been paid. We don't have to pay the price. If we know him as our Lord and Savior, we don't have to pay the price anymore because we have submitted, we have embraced this. We have embraced him as our Lord and Savior. We, we have said to him, we, we acknowledge that we cannot clean ourselves up. We need you to do it. I can't shed my sin. You need to take it from me. And I give you my life because you gave your life for me. I saw one post today, and some of you have seen it because I reposted it. And I, I don't remember word for word, but it was said something like this, that you cannot understand the empty tomb unless you've already been to the cross. We can't. We don't understand what, it ha what, what the whole empty tomb would mean nothing if we don't understand the cross because that's where the price was paid. Now the tomb is where death is defeated. We still wage a war against it. We still have battles with death. We're all going to die. We still suffer in this body. We, we, we battle sin. But ultimately, these things have already been defeated because we know and kind of timely that we would have a brother go home right before this, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's experiencing what we hope for, what we long for. It is finished. The declaration of, of, of victory. So we have a prayer to the Father. We have a pardon of a sinner. We have the taking care of his business as far as his mother and taking care of his mother, taking on of the wrath of God. Reminding us that a man did this. There was one man in all of history that was able and worthy and, and, and it, he was able to do it for us. And, and that he was able to pay the price. That he was acceptable. I mean, maybe that's what I'm looking for. Acceptable to God as a sacrifice. And at the end of all of it, that, those words, it is finished. That is a declaration of victory over all of it. Sin's been paid. He knows he's about to, to give up his spirit, but it's all paid for. He knows he's coming back in three days. He's already told his, his followers he's coming back in three days. And so the last thing, a prayer to the Father. This begins with a prayer to the Father. And this ends. This is his whole life. His whole life. I didn't come to say my words. I came to say what the Father wants me to say. I didn't come to do my will. I came to do the will of the Father. When we went through John, that was over and over and over again. His prayer in the garden. If there's any other way, but not my will, but your will. Prayer of submission in the garden. And he's done it all. He's done everything the Father's asked him to do. So verse 44 in Luke, Luke 23. I'll start with 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Can't forget that, can we? In one place, it says it was torn from top to bottom. 18 inches thick, top to bottom. Can you imagine the priests in the temple hearing that happen? That's not going to, I mean, you, you've you ripped rags before. It makes some noise. Can you imagine something that's this thick? It's an elaborate fabric, and you begin to hear it rip in the holy place? What that would sound like? And the veil is torn in two. We are able now to go to the throne ourselves. We don't have to have a high priest take us in because our high priest has already taken in the sacrifice once and for all. We don't have to do it. We don't have to have somebody else do it for us. He's already done it for us. In verse 46, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last prayer of the Father. And what does all this do to shape the world even at that very moment? I mean, there's his, his last words are barely out of his mouth 
And look at verse 47. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. One acknowledges Jesus. Verse 48 says, And the whole crowd who came together to see that sight, seeing what had been done, beat their breast and returned. And all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at, the, at a distance watching these things. So evidently the apostles weren't brave enough to come straight to the cross and stand at the foot of the cross. At least nobody but John. But they all stood off in the distance and watched what happened. They saw the darkness. They heard the cries from the cross. Some of them are close enough to hear the centurion say, Surely this was a righteous man. In Matthew it says, he said, Surely this was the Son of God. Another centurion converted. I think he was converted. I think he saw it all and he couldn't deny it. Maybe he followed Jesus from the arrest all the way, all the way to the cross. And he sees the whole thing. The only, you, you have a, a Jewish man on the cross. An insurrectionist, pardon of his sin. You have a Gentile at the foot of the cross saying, this was the Son of God. I know this was the Son of God. And I look around here in this moment, this intimate moment, and I hope that we've all said that. We know that you're the Son of God. We need to remember this day. Every time we take communion, we remember. Every time we think about the cross, we remember. Don't let your little crosses that hang around your neck be jewelry. If they're not a remembrance, don't wear them. If your pictures aren't a remembrance of the cross, of the crucifixion, if you don't remember what he did every time, if it doesn't hit you a little bit every time, take them down because it's becoming religious. There's nothing religious about this. He fulfilled the law without being religious. Everything that was needed for man to be reunited with God, Jesus did it. The culmination of that on the cross. And then because we embrace the cross, we get to experience the new life, the resurrected life. Because we don't just follow him to the cross and just leave him on the cross. He's not on the cross any more than he's in a tomb. I said this on Sunday. Our Savior, our Messiah is the only one in all of the religions of the world, the only one who came back from the dead. Everybody else is in a tomb or an urn or wherever, scattered to the wind, whatever they were. Ours is the only one who came back. And we don't just have to identify with the cross. We get to identify with his life. We get to identify with his resurrection. The business on the cross is taken care of. Our hope lies in the resurrection. And our hope, the day that we live in, we hope it's soon. We hope it's soon. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word. Lord, that you had people who were able to hear your very words on the cross. Lord, how amazing it is that you even had the strength to say the words that needed to be said. The courage and the strength of character to even face the cross and all that it entailed. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, may we remember in these next few days and in the days to come all that you've done. Lord, we never forget and may we never stop looking for your coming again. Lord, may we be about the business and the mission that you've given us to preach the gospel and to make disciples until you return. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>